This episode is brought to you by WHU, the Otto Beisheim School of Management. WHU is reshaping the way students learn about business, management, finance, and entrepreneurship through its innovative programs and partnerships in Germany and across the globe. To learn more about this globally ranked university, visit whu.edu today. Hey folks, Garrett here. In this episode, we introduce Sven Greulich. WHU alum, lawyer, and partner at world-renowned law firm Oric Harrington and Sutcliffe. You may have heard of Oric for its role in some of Silicon Valley's most noteworthy mergers and acquisitions like Instagram, Yammer, and Nest. But with Sven leading the charge, Oric is fast becoming a major bridge for German companies entering the U.S. market and U.S. investments into German startups. Today we're discussing legal topics relevant to founders, just without the hourly billable rate. So enjoy this one on us. Coming to you from WHU, on the banks of the Rhine River, in beautiful Fallendar, Germany, this is the best and most awesome founder podcast. A show about entrepreneurs, innovators, advisors, and educators, and the stories that make them who they are today. Uh, my name is Sven Reulich. I'm a proud alumni of the Kellogg WHU Executive MBA program. Um, was part of the um, KW16 class, um, graduated in 2014. And I'm a partner at Oric Harrington and Sutcliffe. It's an international law firm. And I work with startups, technology companies, and their investors. Um, tend to be a little bit more on the later stage, but also occasionally do early stage um, advice. And I'm happy to have you here. So, Sven, welcome. Perhaps you can begin by telling us where you come from and how you ended up as a partner at Oric. I uh, studied law and economics um, in, in Münster and in Nijmegen and um, did a, a doctor, uh, got a PhD later and did a master's studies in New Zealand and um, started to practice law back in 2006, um, learned the ropes of M&A and private equity at uh, my, my first uh, law firm, um, great firm called Hengeler Müller in 2012. It was time for me to move on um, after amazing years at Hengeler. And I interviewed with a couple of law firms and the only one who didn't want to talk me out of my idea to do an executive MBA was Oric. And it came as kind of a shock, you know, like I was introduced to partners in the US and the question was not, you know, why do you want to do that? But how much do you want us to support? And because um, they, you know, they, they, to be frank, they didn't know, you know, who VHU was, but they knew Kellogg. And they had an idea and a plan with me. They wanted to move me into technology and build on strengths on strengths. We are strong in the US and technology transactions, uh, one of the top dogs in, in venture capital. And they wanted to um, expand that practice in Germany. And they said, like, you know, an executive MBA program at Kellogg, that would be great. And so I ended up starting at Oric and um, did my EMBA um, class. And uh, as I said, that's where the whole thing started. Um, because I had the pleasure to be in a great class with amazing people, like, and, and you know, founders, entrepreneurs. I, I count five, six startups that came out of our class, and we were only 54 people. We were only 54 people. And I had the pleasure to sit next to a guy. Um, who's uh, Tim Tabe, um, the CEO of Credit Shelf, and uh, he was a successful banker. And um, at one day he came to me and said, like, Sven, you're a lawyer and you know VC and, and startups and you've worked with them. And um, have I ever shared this story with you? I want to I wanna found my own company. I want to do a fintech. And I said, like, Tim, that's awesome, but you know, like, you're a super successful banker. And he said, like, no, but I want to have my own company and at least want to give it a shot. And so in 2014, um, I helped him incorporate Credit Shelf, and that company went public last year um, into the prime standard in, in, in Germany. And it's, it's an amazing story. He's a great guy, uh, focused, driven, you know, like smart as only a few people are that I've ever come across. And um, it's that kind of people you meet at WHO, and, and you have the pleasure then to work with. So you were saying that Oric had a plan for you to lead their technology transaction practice in Germany. Do you have a technology background? I'm on the black sheep in my family, and as my dad always said, I don't know whether it translates into English, but to open a, a window, I need a craftsman. Um, because I'm so, so unskilled there. No, but I got, um, what, what I loved was these, um, 
you know, uh, working in venture capital gives you the chance to speak not to lawyers all the time, but you speak to the, to the founders, you speak to the decision makers at the investment funds. And it's just like, it's a total way, different way of thinking. You know, they said like, Sven, help me, you know, like tell me when to stop, but otherwise just, you know, help me enable things. And I'm, I'm really not interested into the, in, the, in the nuts and bolts of your legal analysis. I need practical guidelines and that does not, you know, every now and then I have to tell them it's a maybe, but more often than not, they say like, yeah, tell me it's more likely yes or more likely no. And um, that drove me um, into this, this, uh, into this market because it's, it's very active, agile, vibrant. You see a lot of business models you come across. Um, do I understand them and do I understand the technology? No, not, not always. Like there are things that I can personally say I'm more fascinated with and I want to learn more about. Um, others um, where the, the, the business model will uh, you know, like always stay a little bit alien to me, but I try to um, understand as much as I can, especially with those startups where I not only do a financing round for an investor, you know, in the first or second round, but I, where I'm the founder and the company council, which I'm more often, um, and I stay with them for years. You know, like, as I mentioned, credit shelf, it was, if you are gearing up for an IPO, you need to understand the business model. You also need a you know, rudimentary understanding of the technology they're uh, applying. And um, so, yeah, but it's, it's, um, it's interesting because, you know, even as a lawyer, you can learn these things. Of all the lucrative paths you could have taken with your law degree, you chose to work with technology startups. Um, arguably not the most pr uh, profitable angle to practicing law. What made you choose that direction? I mean, to, to be frank here, I don't spend 100% of my time working with startups in the early stages. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work out economically, neither for myself nor for Oric, because you know, we'll come to that probably. Um, lawyers, especially good lawyers, are not cheap, um, especially the international ones who can help a startup scale across the border. And for us, it's a portfolio approach. You know, I spend a large chunk of my time doing classical M&A buyouts, technology transactions. And then you have a portfolio of startups, um, some in the, in the early phases where it's basically for you also kind of an investment project. Um, some of them who are in series A, B and C uh, financing rounds, um, startups that then need, you know, like uh, labor law advice, cybersecurity, data privacy, IP protection, where you can cross sell. And then you have some who are ready for an exit. Um, and that's uh, uh, where you then, you know, earn, earn the money um, uh, also as a law firm. Um, like, there's, a, there's a quote um, it's from a partner, another law firm that I heard once. It said, like, you know, being a VC lawyer or startup lawyer means you're short-term generous in order to be long-term greedy. You know, don't get me wrong, your lawyer should not be greedy, but it's, there's, a, uh, there's some truth to, the, to this. You know, like, you have to... When you work on the company side, you have to see your startups as, a, um, as an investment project because you want to build up something. Make no mistake, if the startup is ready for an IPO, no law firms will, you know, will be knocking on your door left, right and center. But if you had the chance to build up a trusted relationship over the years, there's a good chance that um, the firm will stay with you. With a big globally recognized firm like Oric, how do you choose which early stage startups to take on as clients? Are you particularly selective or do you look for specific characteristics in the startups that you work with? Um, I mean, you have to be selective, yeah. I'm not that sure whether we are great at selecting um, firms because that's just like we see part of a portion of our clients don't make it through the first financing round and will go out of the market at some point. That happens too. It's part of the business. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't go out and say like, if you're a startup, go and come and, and work with me and Oric um, or any of the other big international law firms. There's simply startups who don't need us. You know, like if you have a pure play, non-VC business model and you know, like and, and your, your business is in Germany and it's low risk, a legal risk environment, I mean, don't hire Oric. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. You know, you can have a cheaper, 
sufficient local uh, alternatives that they would just do the job and they would do the job fine. Um, if, on the other hand, you are more ambitious by you know growing internationally or you want to attract VC dollars or corporate venture capital dollars, um, especially down the road, maybe US VC uh, money, then um, it might be a good idea to think about um, bringing in an international law firm who knows both uh, sides of the Atlantic um, at an early stage, yes. Um, but it's, you know, many of our clients are introduced to us by um, VCs and say, like, you know, I would like to invest in that company. I have already my law firm here, but um, they need some help. Um, so, because you know, good VCs will make sure that the founders understand what they're doing, and you don't, you're not surprised down the road. And you know, it happens more often than not that we are introduced to founders by a VC. Is so like, you know, I really like that company. I want to invest in them, but you need to educate and um, the, the founders and help them understand what they're doing, so we can close this. And we think that the current lawyer, if any, they have, will not do the job. You know, with this almost dogmatic belief in lean startups these days, most founders are kind of led to believe they should spend as little money as possible, kind of being almost myopically focused on product and sales. Um, maybe you could provide some insight into when and where startups should invest in legal services. You used an interesting phrase. You didn't refer to legal spend as cost, but as an investment, and that's probably how you should think about it. And uh, you know, like I would get now a lot of laughter mm -hmm. if I would say that in front of my WHO crowd. Um, but uh, uh, you know, the the thing is, uh, l let me share a story. I got an email this morning um, on LinkedIn um, by, from somebody who said, like, it's a U.S. startup, and they're now expanding into Europe. And what they said is like, oh, yeah, we signed up for this accelerator program, and we've been through them, and we signed all this paperwork. But um, we think that you know, some of the rules are ambiguous, and we're not really sure what our obligations are. Can you help us understand this? Shit. And no, it's just like, it's, it's, I would not hold it against them, because you know, like they are in a, in a, in a fast-growing environment where it's, you know, they have to be dynamic, they have to grab opportunities, and you know, figure things out on the way, but it, like, you know, I didn't have a look at the, at the uh, documentation yet. I would assume everything is fine. It's a reputable accelerator program, um, but it's, it's just like, how can you do this as a founder and sign documents um, that, uh, you know, like whereby you incur certain obligations without, you know, fully understanding this. It's always like, when founders come to me and say, do we need in the early stages a shareholders agreement, you know? I said, like, um, probably not, but you should think about the, the, the topics that you would usually put into a shareholders agreement. You know, it's like, when you get married, do you need a prenuptial agreement? You know, no, maybe not, but you should probably think about um, uh, this, this situation or the scenarios that you would usually put into such an agreement. And if you and your, your spouse feel, and your co-founder feel fine about this and think, yeah, it will work out, then no. I mean, like... Who am I to advise them against this? But what I want them to usually do is uh, have an educated guess. Um, legal spend is just, you know, it, it's a bit like the question: When should we incorporate, or we should, you know, like when when do we should we speak um, to a lawyer? Um, I would usually speak to a, a, a advice client. Say like, once you incorporate, there are certain things you should discuss with your lawyers then. Um, details about the business mo uh, model, you know, like nuts and bolts of data privacy implications of your business model. That's something you might defer because you know you're still working on your on your business model and how to make it work. But when you set up a company and you agree on a share uh, share split with your co-founders, you know, get some advice because you should think about a scenario where you and your co-founder and all the enthusiasm and the great spirit of getting started, um, the things that you haven't thought through. You know, like I see many founded teams fall apart because um, life directions change and usually then they haven't prepared for this in the, in the contracts or they have a 50-50 split in the company. And what do you do then? Because it's, it's kind of a default thing and you know, like every share co-founder should have the same stake. Maybe that's not right. Maybe for the company some of them are worth more than others and that is something that a, a lawyer as a neutral person can help you think through. And whether you still stick with an equal share split, fine, it's your decision as a founder, but then you, know, you can rest assured that you have thought through this thing. Um, but then it's, it's, 
you know, like you can start with local cheaper sources for, for stuff like that, experience ones. You know, lawyers who are it's a small firm, boutique firms in Berlin, they're great out there, who just have a different cost structure than, than we do and who, who will do the trick. I mean, they're fine there. Um, at some point, it might be worth to have an upgrade, um, especially when you go international, when you grow. And I would usually advise startups to work with an experienced lawyer when they are raising funds especially when they're giving out equity, you know, like convertible loan agreements. That's something you might be still able to do basically on your own, although these documents tend to be more, get more complex and you should understand the economics and how it works in, in, in these documents. But when you um, raise money, you should have a lawyer at your side because it's just like it, the lawyer will help you to level the playing field. You know, like you may be incorporating a company or starting a company two, three, four times in your life. Of course, there are serial entrepreneurs who have started companies by the dozens and who are, you know, you, you don't have to tell them anything anymore as a lawyer. They just need you as a workbench. But if you are a first or second timer, um, keep in mind that the person on the other side of the table is doing this for a living. And although I believe that good VCs or the good VCs I know are working with the founders um, to a common goal. Keep in mind, everybody has his or her own agenda. People react to incentives, and um, if the company does not develop as expected, um, you might find yourself not in the same boat and not with aligned interest. And a good lawyer can just help you level that playing field and come to an amicable solution. the value in investing in legal services as early as when you divide equity among founders. You know, I, I've gone through some hardships in this realm myself, founding a, a startup with a group of friends while, you know, neglecting to kind of establish founder stock vesting. What are your thoughts about the legal implications of founding a startup with your homies? You know, like founding with friends, I think it can be extremely beneficial because, by, you know, face it, um, most of the time, this is the only reservoir of talent that you have access to in the in the early days, and um, you have a common history and 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 a legacy to share. And usually, there's there's trust, and you know how these people react. And in times of crisis, if you have been with them through WHO and through these hellish preparations for the exam periods, I mean, you you, you lived lived with them for a while. You, ha you should have an, if, you know, a good feeling on, on how they will react. So it might be a good co-founder, just a personal note on that. Um, but that, again, like th this is where you need a sounding board in the initial phases because these, uh, these, these conversations are awkward. You know, like if, if you have to sit together with your friend and talk about money, that is awkward. It's, it's, you know, it's the same with your spouse. But then if you have you know, a lawyer to, you know, which, to whom you can project your, your anger, your frustration, your irritation to a certain degree. That, that can help you and say like, okay, but just, you know, let, let's play in, uh, I'll give you a scenario. You can be person A or B in that scenario, but how would you want person B to react? Okay, and then let's think this through. And then do you want to put it into a contract or not? And then yes, you can agree on a Westing scheme, especially if, you know, like when you have incorporated already, and you've been down the road six, 12 months and you need to bring in more hands now. Um, that's probably a good idea to think about a vesting scheme, yes. One of the things interesting about your work that we discussed offline is that you kind of straddle both the German and US technology startup ecosystems. Can you tell us a little bit about your work in the US versus Germany and how do you kind of help bridge this transatlantic divide? I mean, that's, that's basically, where we have um, like some others, where we have our value proposition is um, if we, you want to bridge the Atlantic. Usually, there are two scenarios: you either you're looking for VC dollars from the US because these funds are just larger and they can write, you know, bigger checks and they can help you to roll out and execute, um, or you want to expand into the US market because it's just a market of 300 million people, and you want to you know go to market there. And that's where startups come to us. So. Um, and we see that there's, 
there's so many ties already. Um, two weeks, was it? On March 19th ago, two weeks ago was, um, was demo day at Y Combinator. And um, I can share this now. And we had the pleasure to work with two German companies, uh, Demo Desk and uh, Match App, um, two young German technology companies, great founder teams, um, who were selected for the winter batch of Y Combinator and had to the chance to present to one of the most selective crowds, you know, that is out there in in in, in the Bay Area, and that's that's great because you know they they came to us. Y Combinator has a rule; they only invest in in U.S. companies. So although these are, you know, in the core, they are German companies, they are the GmbHs, you know, limited liability companies under German law based in, in Germany with the folks being hired in the German company, they had to implement a US structure. And, you know, like commonly referred to as a flip. Um, so whether you put a, a Delaware Inc. on top of that German company, um, move uh, the existing shareholders a level higher, which is some extent, there are always tax implications, but you give Y Combinator something that they can invest in and that US investors feel familiar with. And that was something where we could help them, you know, because like, we have a strong presence. San Francisco is still our largest office. Um, we have, I think, seven offices in California. Um, so uh, we could help them there. I want to give you the chance to plug Auric for a second, since it is such a renowned firm that counts some of the world's most successful tech startups as its clients. Can you share some of your firm's perhaps most notable achievements and put into perspective the scope and scale of Oryx's work? Um, okay. Where to begin <laughs> and where to end? Um, no, I'm, I'm not a marketing guy, but for example, like we've been um, named uh, North America's most innovative law firm by Financial Times for three years in a row now, 16, 17, and 18, which is unprecedented. Uh, PitchBook, which is one of the leading data sites, uh, uh, sorry, data collection companies, um, market intelligence, I should say, um, named us uh, number three globally on venture capital in 2018. We are for three years now in a row number one in, in, in Europe, according to, you know, pursuant to deal counts. In the US, um, one figure that I like to give is um, we work with 20% of the unicorns um, in the US, either on company or investor side. And that, um, you know, that is a lot. Um, renowned deals in the US that we are probably best known for is um, the divestment of uh, Yammer, Jammer to, to Microsoft Corporation or Instagram's um, exit um, to Facebook. You know, or uh, we work with Nest um, when it was acquired um, by Google uh, for a couple of billions. And that, you know, these are the large tickets. But as I said before, like we, we, we you know, we work with more than 2,000 startups, and, and these are, of course, the success stories we share. Mm -hmm. But let's be frank and honest, we lose a certain percentage of our clients each year because the startups just fail, and we are not better in selecting startups than, than uh, you know, like uh, every other uh, law firm or, or uh, investor. So that's why we follow this portfolio approach. We like to work with startups in the early phases, but and then you know grow this portfolio and build up relationships and work with the companies all the way to the exit but that is easier and that's one thing if you look at lawyers in germany in the us because in the us it's just like everything is way more standardized than it is in germany so it's way more predictive um you know like how much you will you know as a law firm have to spend on a certain client to get them through series a because um you know people are working from the same set of templates um, in, in the US that you need to adjust there so the you know like you don't start from scratch stitching documents together um, uh, business angels tend to be more sophisticated at least in Silicon Valley um, and know each other and so there's usually less of a negotiation around these these terms and um, players there know what's market and that's to a certain extent still different in Germany although we have come down the learning curve a lot in the last years, according to my experience, um, and there are efforts out there to standardize um, documentation to make you know legal spend you know less and, and incorporating um, in, in, in incorporating in Germany more efficient, but they are still in an early stage, so we're not yet there, and that's why for international law firms who have certain you know profit expectations, it is. It is challenging to work only with early stage startups, yeah. From my 
my experience founding startups, both in Germany and the US, it seems that there's some real barriers to entry for startups in Germany, specifically when it comes to legal structure and costs of incorporation. That is, that is an, an accusation that I hear a lot that, you know, like things in Germany are slow and, and it's, it's a burdensome to incorporate. Um, I think we've, we've made, you know, great progress here. First of all, it's uh, for GmbH, minimum capital is 25,000 euros, of which you would have to put, you know, half of it uh, into the bank account right from the start. But the thing is, it's just not money sitting there and has, uh, in, you can spend it. I mean, you cannot um, redistribute it to shareholders, but you can spend it. You can pay your lawyers and the notary with that 25,000 euros. And many startups will require at some point in time, 25,000 euros. And, you know, um, in certain business, you shouldn't start when you don't have 25,000 euros because it's just like it's a lost proposition from the beginning. Um, but even if you don't have the 25,000 euros and you just want to get started, there's cheaper alternatives. I mean, like it's a bulky name, not particularly well selected, UG Haftungsbeschränkt. You know, only Germans can come up with such a <laughs> word monster. Um, but that's something you can have for, for way less there. So if you just want to get started and you have, want to have the liability shield, and that is a company uh, form that, you know, 10 years ago when it was introduced, um, I would have considered it a bit shady. You know, now in, in, in Berlin, you see them all over the place. And for the, for the first year or two, you know, they suffice in many cases. And um, also incorporation, yeah, it is, it's true. In the US, uh, you know, you, many things you can do online and it's faster. And in, in Germany, you still have to wait um, until your company is registered and that can take some time, but usually it's not that long and that will not, you know, sink the ship um, down the road. So um, there are other things that, you know, like probably in Germany we could work more on and, and have, uh, uh, you know, like it's, as I said, the, the, the idea of standardization. Um, as you see, like many startups, founders use documents they, you know, get from the high tech Gründer for, uh, or Axel Springer um, templates that we see used frequently in non Axel Springer uh, uh, investments because they were just kind of a de facto standard setter. If we can make progress there, that would certainly help. You know, like come up with something like the NVZA in America, you know, um, templates that give you options and explanations that that would be a good idea here. As someone who's helped negotiate and structure investment deals on both sides of the pond, do you see any major differences in the sophistication of investors in Germany versus the US? You know, specifically as it pertains to deal structures or preferences, valuations, and you know, founder-friendly terms? You touch upon something that's really, really important. Um, especially for founders, and that can have profound implications down the road, is what kind of rights and pref preference rights you give to your early stage investors, especially to the angels. And that is something where we see startups, you know, that's, they take whatever money comes into the door. And um, the investor, you know, like uh, more or less sophisticated business angels, put something forward, maybe something they found online. And um, yeah, there's, you know, like when it comes to liquidation preference, to anti-dilution, there's always a founder-friendly uh, proposition, there's middle ground, and there's an aggressive investor-friendly position. And um, founders might not understand what they're doing there, and so they agree on onerous terms. And so you see early stage um, investment agreements that are worth of you know, a serious DOE uh, uh, financing agreement with a lot of terms. And then that can have, um, that can make the financeability of that company dif difficult because you know like at some point there would be a sophisticated investor come in and, and I had that experience where I advised um, a large US investor on an investment in a German company with a sizable round and my mission was to talk the business angels and early stage investors out of some of the preference rights because at some point founders will understand for example like one thing is liquidation preference you know like the you know, the difference participating, non-participating. But if you have um, participating liquidation preferences in the early rounds and each new investor that comes in just stacks up to, to, to the liquidation preferences, you will ha end up with a liquidation overhang that at some point, you know, like the founder will run the numbers. And um, so the, uh, and they will find out that although on paper they still have 30% equity in the company, that unless it is an exit of at least, you know, why million, um, they will basically get nothing. And funny thing is these things always pop up in times of crisis when you need the founders to be the most committed um, to the company. And that's something where, and it, it doesn't make also economically sense because if you're investing 50,000, 100,000 as a business angel, 
you know, and then you see three, four rounds of um, VCs coming on top of your participating liquidation preference. You know, unless it's a high exit, you would basically, you know, like economically, you, you, you're like a common shareholder, but you set the tone for the next financing rounds because investors tend to, you know, like ask for at least the rights that the earlier round investors have. And now you want to, you know, have, you have additional ideas as well. And that's why we generally tend to advise like, you know, like haggle about um, valuation and have a fair equity split, but try to keep it lean in the first rounds. Because um, it's just like it's it's a, it's a package. It adds complexity and it makes negotiations with the um, investors more difficult. And it also sends a wrong signal because it sends like you know your business angels are either not so uh, sophisticated or very greedy, and the founder didn't know what they were doing in the in the early rounds, and both are not positive signals. like so many inexperienced founders focus way too much on valuation and dilution, almost naive to things like preferences and voting rights and board seats, and almost unaware that the devil is kind of most often in the details. Yeah, or they, they, they go for an equity um, investment right away. I mean, think about convertible loans. Convertible loans in the early rounds are a great uh, opportunity because it helps you basically um, to avoid the hassle of going through an investment and shareholders agreement. Um, very early on, you can or you know or agree on a valuation. You know you can you can it gives you another maybe six nine months runway. Um, you can develop and then bring in first serious investment money with more sophisticated investors and then convert the the um, the loan lenders um, at that point in time. So that's something that makes sense for small amounts in the early rounds. Yeah, but that's something you know, a good lawyer would tell you. Right. And then there's another thing that um, uh, you know like it's a particularity in Germany. Um, compared when you know when we have founders from the U.S. Um, in Germany, if you're a shareholder of a limited liability company, there are certain rights that are unalienable. So that means even if you have only one share that's worth nominal amount of one euro, um, there are certain rights I cannot take away. And we we've seen come across companies that have prior to the Series A they had 30 shareholders plus, and that just makes the whole thing very complex um, because first of all, there's this Theoretically, there's, there's potential for obstruction, you know, you don't expect that because business angels tend to behave and understand that, um, that the, you know, like they have to keep the founders happy, but it just adds complexity because if you bring in a serious investor then and you agree on investment and shareholders agreement, that investor will usually request all parties to join that agreement. And then, you know, like just going after 30 people for powers of attorney when they're spread all over, you know, over the world, um, it's burdensome. Um, and it just... It, it also, you know, investors tend to think about the exit. And that means that I have to, you know, get either powers of attorney or make 30 people show up in front of a notary to sign a sales agreement when the time of the exit arises. And if, for example, the exit proceeds are not where, you know, everybody initially expected them to be, that might give smaller shareholders pause to think and say, like, okay, you know, is there some, some free riding option, you know? That's me as a lawyer seeing only risks, but um, to keep your cap table lean or at least implement some tools to mitigate this risk, you know, pool these smaller investors. Like um, syndicate? Yeah, syndicate, syndicate, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, there are various ways to do that. Um, but that's, that's something you should think about initially. Because again, like Series B, Series C investor will look at your company and so say like, even if it's, it's, it's a great company, if I fear that there's a lot of complexity down the road, yeah, it's just another, you know, negative that I have to overcome. As we've been talking about the importance of early stage companies investing in legal, I'd kind of like to propose a little scenario to you. So I'm an aspiring German entrepreneur with the next big idea, perhaps with global implications, and I'm getting ready to launch a business with my partners. Do you generally suggest they set up in Germany, incorporate in the U.S.? Or perhaps some other option that's not usually considered. You know, I get um, this this question asked um, in, in basically in every lecture. It's like, you know, should I set up shop here or in the U.S.? 
I mean, first of all, generally, as, as a, a Germany is, is closest to my heart, and this is a great place um, for young companies. And when you see like where this, you know, what has happened over the last ten years, it's just amazing in in in, in, in Germany, and you know, there are great things ahead. Um, when you have a business model that is inherently, um, you know focused on going to the US or, you know, like, we don't really need to talk about the US, it could also be Asia, um, kind of work with startups who were developing some technology um, for elder, elderly people, healthcare, um, low cost solution. They knew that their market would be China. So they still have set up, in, you know, a shop in Germany because um, they wanted to develop the technology here, but they put a Chinese hold core on top of it, Hong Kong hold core. Um, that is something that's sometimes worth exploring. If sooner or later you want to move to the US, you can think about a two-tier structure. That means you know you incorporate in Delaware Inc. and that Delaware Inc. incorporates a German um, GmbH. So you know what the outcome of the flip you do right away from the start. Um, it may make sense. There are certain um, uh, US investors who still very much prefer to invest in a US company, although that has changed a lot over the last years. You know, like those startup, uh, those VCs. Who are willing to invest into company outside of Silicon Valley um, tend to have little to no problems with investing into a GmbH these years. I mean, those who are here will not request you to do a, a flip. There might be other reasons to do a flip, you know, like uh, exit on IPO plan in the US. Um, that's something you can initially think about. On the other hand, um, keep in mind that if you have a two tier structure, it adds complexity because you have two companies that you have to maintain. You have to, you know, prepare financial statements, um, uh, comply with regulatory rules and two jurisdictions right from the start. And if you have all your founders and all the managers sitting in Germany while you are running and managing it in, in Inc., you, you might get into tax issues as well. So um, it adds complexity, but there are scenarios where it's worth thinking about this right away. Um, and I would do this, in, you know, frankly, do this early on. And also another thing, um, that we frequently ask is how shall I set up my German company? Shall I as a founder invest directly or hold my shares through an UG? You know, and that's something, it has tax implications down the road in, in an exit scenario. It's worth spending half an hour on legal fees up front on this. Because um, to implement these things later down the road is just more complex and more costly and might not get you all the way there. So it sounds to me like perhaps the best place for founders to start is to make a small investment and perhaps an hour or two of legal consultation, you know, to explore alternatives and some of the potential legal challenges that may lie ahead. There are good law firms out there, reputable law firms who are doing a great job advising companies there. And, um, you know, like Oreg was not the pioneer in this market. There were others um, who went into this, this market way ahead of us and did a great job. Um, and they understand the financial uh, limitations of the company. You know, like if, if you raise the first hundred thousand, and I am um, the, I take away a large chunk of that money, that will neither help the company nor my reputation. So um, personally, I always give away um, to founders my you know like hourly rates that we do, so that they have an understanding on you know my calculation. But then you can agree on caps, or you can agree on a deferred. Payment where you say like, okay, uh, uh, you know, up to X amount of euros, I can do this, um, and we agree that you will only pay me once you have raised the first uh, amount of money, so you can help them with them, and um, that's, you know, it's not really an investment, but it's kind of our co-investment into establishing into a long-term relationship because long-term working with startups only makes sense if you can actually work long-term with them, because. You know, like, what's the point of me taking X thousand euros on the first million they raise and they will never work with me again? earlier that you have a few clients that just went through Y Combinator. 
And if you know anything about the Silicon Valley tech scene, you know that Y Combinator is harder to get into than any Ivy League college or top tier consulting firm in terms of competitiveness. With two German companies participating in the recent cohort, can you share your perspectives on the evolution and trajectory of the German startup scene? I mean, Auric in general and, and me personally, we're very optimistic. That's why, you know, if, if a good lawyer is out there seeking new opportunities, come and join us. We need you. No, seriously, he is, um, uh, we've come down a learning curve. Um, what, what's been going on in Berlin is, is amazing, but not only Berlin, other tech hubs all around the, uh, Germany. And especially we see a recent more and more shift in focus on B2B um, uh, business models where we don't try to emulate or copy an existing US um, B2C model, but we you know, add strengths to strengths. Uh, combining German engineering uh, and, and, and with, with you know, digitalization and new business models, um, there's a lot of prospects um, there and I'm, I'm very optimistic there um, because um, it's also attributable to WHO and, and uh, one of the big you know, investors and company builders, they produce quote unquote, um, uh, sophisticated and knowledgeable people who, you know, seek job opportunities at corporates who go through the ranks, but who understand the lingua franca of VC and um, who understand these, these uh, entrepreneurial zeal and ideas and can help the corporates understand it and be more open. And I'm, personally, I'm a big, big fan and believer in corporate venture capital when done right. I know that I'm a bit of a contrarian here with many VCs, but I think they can, in, in Germany, they are a very important part of the funding uh, mix um, down the road. Um, and these, these young people help them understand um, the startup world. And we have only begun that race. Since we're almost out of time, I'd like to touch on a subject that we discussed before turning on the mic that you said was kind of near and dear to your heart. Now, I don't want to shift the focus of this con conversation to a more somber tone, but perhaps you'd like to pick up where you left off on the topic of New Zealand and the, the recent tragedy over there. Only briefly, because it still makes me, you know, like, uh, get moody here. Um, in 2007, I spent a year in New Zealand, um, and I lived in Christchurch. And um, who ever had the chance to go and see New Zealand, especially and, and meet the, uh, especially meet the people there, it's, it's just like, it's, I mean, it's the most beautiful country in the world that I've seen so far, period. Uh, it's amazing people. And, um, and I, in Christchurch, it was when, when me and my wife um, got together on our 10th anniversary, we went there. Um, and on, when we returned, we learned that, uh, you know, my wife was pregnant and, and we have a little daughter now. Um, and then you see these pictures and you, you, I still have so many, you know, friends, there who literally two of them live a block away from Hackley Park and then although this is this is probably the country that is the furthest away from Germany it becomes so close and um, it, these were tragic events and it's the, the, it was but it was inspiring to see how the people reacted and um, you know Jacinda Ardern's the Prime Minister of New Zealand the courage she showed the action she took and the, the words she spoke in a bi and multi-partisan way was, it was just inspiring. I mean, like if, if I can't remember that I, the last time I had so much admiration for, for a political leader. And that was just, I mean, go there, cut it short, go there, meet the people of New Zealand, see this wonderful place, and um, Kiwis, if you hear this, keep it up. I'm with Sven, keep it up. We can all learn from how you act with grace and dignity in the face of tragedy. Anyway, on a lighter note, I'd like to wrap things up with a few questions that I like to ask everyone behind the mic, providing a little insight into your life kind of outside of the boardroom. So what book is currently on your bedside table? Um, on the, on the uh, bedside table, I have a... <laughs> honestly, for a couple of months now, um, a biography of uh, Kissinger and his legacy, uh, political legacy, the mixed one that a friend gave me as a present. I'm not yet third through this, so um, if you hear this, I'll finish it, I promise. But um, yeah, it's just like um, when you come home late, it's just like 
too little time to read usually, um, especially now that I have, have my, my baby um, daughter and I, I love to spend as much time with her as I can. But I'm a big fan of Audible. And my last question, what's on your playlist? What's your current jam? Probably the most unsophisticated person on the planet to talk about that. Um, I'm a 90s kid. I still listen to Metallica. It's, uh, it's embarrassing these days, but yeah, it's Metallica and Iron Maiden are still, still my number one right. in two bands. We are of the same era. Well, Sven Greilich, thank you so much for inviting me here to your beautiful offices in the heart of Dusseldorf and speaking so candidly about your experiences working with startups and, and life in general. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. And I'm always, always happy to, to support the VHU community. That was Sven Groilich, technology attorney extraordinaire and partner at world-renowned law firm Oric Harrington and Sutcliffe. Be sure to join us for our next episode with Marco Vitor, co-founder of the world's largest seller of hearing aids, Audi Bene, aka Hear.com. We'll be talking founding stories, capitalization, and being data-driven in management, leadership, and decision-making. It's one you don't want to miss. Bis nächstes Mal.